Oh. I'm going to jump ahead because you've answered number 10 uh, about are you collaborating with others on the project? And if yes, are these existing or new collaborations? Well, they were, it's a new collaboration. These were indeed researchers that I knew. Um, many of them had been my former students, were graduated, but you know they just got off to their own universities. But what was interesting is that each of them recognized the problem, and several of them contacted me, and then I, you know, was recognizing the others. So. It was just this exchange of emails across the world saying, you know, what's happening in your country? What's happening in your country? Maybe we ought to do something about this. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they, since many of them were my students, uh, they had, I used to, you know, at, at Pitt, I taught the doctoral seminar in systems theory. And uh, most doctoral programs in public policy have such a seminar, and so I introduced them all to complex systems, so they were all familiar with complex systems, <laughs> <laughs> and they would say, that's covered, it's a complex system, yes, <laughs> it's a complex system, but they were able, what was gratifying to me was they were able to recognize the problem very quickly, and while we had not worked together in any kind of formal way, then the working group from Converge gave us an opportunity to, you know, really begin thinking about this. And, uh, and as we did, I started looking for support for the group, you know, to continue the group. And uh, this is why we're submitting this NSF grant. Excellent. Or proposal, rather, I should say. So Converge um, enabled you to, to formalize the group to move ahead to the next step. Has, yes. has Converge played any other roles in this project? Well, uh, certainly I think most of the people in the network were familiar with the Natural Counseling Center. Uh, several of them had attended workshops in the past. Uh, Several of them had worked with me as graduate students on, um, you know, response studies. Um, Aya Okada in Japan, Michael Siciliano in Haiti, um, Haibo Zhang in China, uh, Kyokun Ko had been my graduate research assistant uh, when he was doing his work. He did not work with me on a specific response study. Uh, earthquakes aren't that common in Korea, <laughs> uh, but he you know, certainly uh, knew about this work. So um, they were familiar with my focus on cognition and communication and decision making and complex systems. Okay. okay. So, uh, they were, you know, just to, to go back to Converge, I think all of them were familiar with the Hazard Workshop and uh, the Hazard Center in Colorado. Almost, almost all. Okay. Yeah. So, um, just before you started the COVID-19 project, were there, was there another research project that you were doing? Oh, yeah. well, uh, several, actually, okay. and I am so pleased because right today, literally, we are on the verge of completing a long-standing research project in Indonesia, and this was to develop a, an early tsunami detection system, a prototype system, that combined an underwater network with a land-based network to identify the trigger. And, it's, you know, it's basically the same problem, decision-making and urgent <laughs> death, but this time in a different location using different technologies, and I've always been interested in the techno you know, technical aspect of it. But this has been um, a 
again, it was a National Science Foundation grant at Hazard Sea, and uh, we located in Indonesia because Indonesia has a major exposure to disasters, even more so than California. I mean, if it's not earthquakes, it's tsunamis. If it's not tsunamis, mm -hmm. it's floods. If it's not floods, it's volcanic eruptions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we, uh, this is, again, an interdisciplinary project. Six institutions, you know, four from the U.S., two from Indonesia, um, very interdisciplinary. But I'm the PI in public policy, but the technical part is managed by the Freitas and Woods Hole is Oceanographic Engineering, who's an ocean engineer. We have a seismologist, Emil Ocal from Northwestern University, computer scientist, uh, Taya Sinati from the University of Pittsburgh, Kathleen Carley, who's a computational sociologist uh, from uh, Carnegie Mellon, and she did a project on Twitter, uh, was looking at the, you know, the role of Twitter. Interestingly enough, um, all during the project, we talk about technical changes, the Indonesian population essentially shifted from Twitter to WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole Twitter app became basically outdated, but the rest of the project uh, was very, very much uh, in place. And it was, I must say, it's been a difficult, challenging, fascinating, rewarding project to be involved in uh, because the stakes are so high. And right now, we have the Indonesian government looking at the outcome of this prototype. And they are already planning to integrate it into their Indonesian early tsunami warning system. So it's exactly what the NSF yeah. wants to happen. Exactly. You take an idea, you develop it, and we did it over, you know, it took three NSF grants actually to do it because we first had a little, you know, eager grant for two years trying to figure out what to do. Then we had another three-year grant developing a computational model. So it's got to be both under the sea and on land. And then we had, you know, this larger grant that, honestly, we had two-year extensions, and then I, I, we ran out of NSF money, so I had to get additional funding from the Swiss Re Foundation. And then we ran into COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Where everything stopped. And in Indonesia, they, they uh, do lockdowns by islands. You know, it's 18,000 islands. So the island of Sibiru, which is where we wanted to, uh, you know, anchor our, our um, uh, shore station, where the data comes from the undersea nodes, hop by hop across the ocean to a cable that's connected to a shore station, and then it's transmitted by a satellite to uh, BPPP, which is the Indonesian uh, agency that manages these stations, and then on to uh, their scientific agency, BMKG, which is their equivalent of NOAA. But, uh, you know, they locked down the island, <laughs> so we couldn't go. But this week, I mean, literally, it's interesting that we're talking today because I just had this morning the uh, tweets from them saying the Baruna Jaya, it's the BPPG ship that is going to do this. It's nearing, you know, uh, Sephora is one of the islands, and Sidhut is the next island. And, you know, so tomorrow they'll be doing the the review, and then the next day they're going to be laying the cable. <laughs> so That's it's so fast. Right now. <laughs> wow. So wow. it's pretty exciting. Wow. And then I had, uh, since I'm now living in California, I stepped down from my full-time job, although I'm finishing these projects and I have doctoral students that I'm through their dissertations at Pittsburgh, so I'm 
I'm still on the faculty at Pittsburgh and interacting with my doctoral students just like this, like video <laughs> conference. Um, but living here in California, where California really is disaster central, I've been working with a group of researchers at UC Berkeley, and I'm actually a faculty affiliate at the policy lab of their Center for Information Technology Research in the interest of society, citizens. And so I'm really looking at um, the, the same problem of communication to support decision making and how it happens. And right now in California, the much more frequent and more urgent issue is wildfire. And uh, this house in which I'm sitting right now, which is half a mile from the year Hayward Fall, was lost in the 1991 fire, uh, the Oakland Hills fire. So I've also been, you know, very much interested in wildfire, and I've been working with the CDC. Did a small, again, a quick response study through Laurie's um, Converge facility of the campfire uh, and the town of Paradise, mm -hmm. and we're also working with a small community, Golinas which is north of San Francisco, and it's this little tiny community with only 1,500 souls that is perched literally on the edge of, of the, the uh, continent, literally, uh, on the edge of, of uh, California with the you know, ocean right behind it. But it's literally in an area where there's one road in and one road out, and to the east are swaths of dry California wildlands that could burn in an instant. So this little community is very, very worried about you know, wildfire, and the whole phenomenon of climate change has affected California so significantly. And what has happened is that wildfire, they used, they used to call it wildfire season, and it would be September and October, maybe a little bit into November. Well, now the governor says, we've got wildfire season all year round. And what happens is in the summer, you know, California has two seasons, basically rainy and dry. And from October to March is the rainy season, and then April through you know September, or almost October, is it gets very hot and it's gloriously beautiful. And people love to go to the beach, and all those those wildland grasses you know become dry and brittle and ready to burn. So this is what has caused the fires that were. The North Bay fires in 2017, the fires in 2018, and worse for California, a big state, right, thousand mile coastline, when there are fires burning in both the North and the South, uh, it just stretches the resources of the state enormously. And uh, in Southern California, there's a particularly meteorological phenomenon in California that is drives these wildfires, and if the central part of the state is hot and dry, and the ocean, so I live in San Francisco Bay Area, I live in Oakland, and the fog comes in every night and cools it, and so it's this lovely temperature, you know, most of the time it's 72 degrees here, <laughs> but, you know, beyond the coastal hills, it gets very, very hot. And in the hot summers, they, usually the fog comes in and cools, you know, the coastal area of the bay. But there are times in the hot summer when the winds come from the hot, dry inland part and flow towards the ocean. And then those winds become very intense and very fast. And that's what drives the wildfires. And so in the 2017 wildfires, the winds were, you know, 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. And that's, you know, almost category one hurricane, right? 
And so, and in, when those wings start, literally, nothing can put out the fire. You have to wait for the rain to come. And that's what is so scary. So, so I've been working with this group, uh, basically engineers and computer scientists, looking at communications and evacuation for these small coastal cities that can't get out. And we're actually applying for another grant. This time it is supported by the University of California because they are doing what I think is very sensible. They're using their campuses as resources for providing informed guidance to the city officials. So the program we're looking now, as a matter of fact, we have a a Zoom meeting at 2 o'clock this afternoon <laughs> with the Deputy Chief of the Open Fire Department about this project. And it's the, I will say that the emergency services in California are so aware that this problem is so difficult, they can't manage it alone. So they're reaching out to, uh, you know, the universities and how can you help us, what kinds of modeling can you do, um, how can we anticipate, how can we engage the community more so you don't have to lose, you know, 85 people like they did in Paradise. So this particular project has just kept going through the pandemic, just switching from in-person activities to Zoom? <laughs> yes, actually it has. It has. And as a result, actually, I think it's had a very creative uh, turn. So since we started Sorry, those people are going to call me back. <laughs> uh, the, um, we started playing, we were working one of the professors on this um, project. Oh, oh me, yes, please. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm on a Zoom call, that's why I, I clicked it off, but then I realized it's Atlas TV. So, you were going to tell me the time that you could come tomorrow? Uh, today? Uh, that's fine, that's fine, okay. Yeah. No, 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 that's fine, I've got a Zoom meeting with you, so it's all good, it should be fine. Okay? Okay, thank you. Sorry. Not not a problem. Uh, all okay. the house maintenance activities were put on hold, and this is <laughs> one of the they have to come and check the the heating ducts for my furnace, which is you know talking about wildfire. <laughs> <laughs> Do all kinds of preventive maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, we had been playing. One of the professors is the professor of design. So the key issue is how do you shorten this gap between position and action? And one of the things we wanted to do is to get people in the community to think more creatively about what they would do in a situation. So we created a game. And he had little figures and kind of little analog game. And and these are the people, and if you're in a situation, so you create a scenario, you know, it's 9.30 on a Saturday morning, the surf is up, the town is full of surfers, et cetera, and all of a sudden there's no wildfire. And the county emergency management says, everyone out, oh, we have to evacuate. So who would you take? How would you go? What vehicles, what route would you take? And this is this little town that has one road on and one road on. And you've got to get 1,500 people on. And so we were playing this game, and the people loved it and, and started thinking very imaginatively about other ways that they would take and, you know, how they would do this. And, you know, you, you know, my husband works in San Francisco, and I'm here, and my kids are in school there, and how do we connect, et cetera, all of these things. 
And we were all set to have a community meeting of about 30 or 40 people to play the scene in small groups because what I was interested in was identifying the informal groups within a community. So how does communication travel with, you know, among people in the community when, for instance, those cell phones are out or whatever? Well, we couldn't do it. We couldn't meet <laughs> because of COVID-19. So my um, the engineering colleague said, well, let's do it digitally. We'll create a digital twin. So they created a digital twin of the community and then are developing a game uh, that people can play digitally. And actually, I think it improves the situation because many more people can play it and this as a prototype and put it to other communities that face similar situations. Now, the context will be different. Um, you know, a different town is going to have a you know, different configuration and different kinds of threats and different kinds of resources. Mm -hmm. But the concept, I think, would apply to other situations. So, so this is uh, what, we're, what we're doing. And the University of California, the whole system, all 10 campuses, has a program. So this is, you know, it's a very small project. But they want the campuses to work together. So this program is linking Berkeley, Davis, Santa Cruz, and Los Angeles in developing a the whole process of developing a digital twin for two hazards, both earthquakes and wildfires, <laughs> and turning it into a digital game. So um, it, it's fun, and uh, you know I think it's going to be very important because. The wildfires come almost every year, and getting people prepared and ready to work on the mess is, is very important. That's really exciting. That's really neat. I I hope you're going to share that on the on the Seer and Converge website so that the rest of us can see and maybe try playing the game with our students. <laughs> Well, this is another thing that, of course, I'm very much interested in. Uh, this could be very, very applicable to uh, classes, and especially if you're teaching classes, and now most universities have some kind of program in systems, or if it's not, you know, straight up emergency management, it's, you know, extreme events or something. And my classes at Pittsburgh were always interdisciplinary, so I always had, you know, students from computer science, information sciences, engineering, along with my students in public policy. And uh, it's really interesting because the students in engineering, they'll look at the transportation networks. And with the students in sociology, they're going to look at the, you know, nonprofit organizations. The students in public policy are going to look more at the law. <laughs> So, uh, but it gets them really looking at this problem as a systems problem and how each of these services needs to interact, reinforce, and coordinate with, with one another. So, yes, I think it would be very appropriate to play in, in classes. Yeah, excellent. Is it okay if we go a bit over time, or do you have another... Uh, no, I'm fine. Oh, it's just out of bug. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, here. I have to share with you. So I just got a WhatsApp note from my colleague in Indonesia. He says the Gurunajaya Jaya is in Sephora. This is a different island. Sephora's water tonight. Tomorrow it will enter the harbor and the mayor will visit the ship. And PTA at Sibirut about eight hours after the mayor's visit. So we're on track. Excellent. <laughs> it's great to have such good news. <laughs> oh, yeah. wonderful. Yes, it's fine. Uh, my only constraint is uh, the Atlas Heating is coming to check the heating ducts at 1030 on my time. So okay. that's an hour. Okay, just just let me know. Sure. So.
so you talked about the focus of your COVID-19 research um, in the earlier part of the interview. Do you want to elaborate on some of the specific goals for the COVID-19 study and what you and your colleagues hope to accomplish? Well, what we really want to accomplish is to develop a working prototype of a policy that could be used by different, at different levels of jurisdiction, local towns, counties, states, nations, and importantly, a global
Those are very ambitious goals. <laughs> I know they are. I know they are. But I think we've got to try. Ab- we don't absolutely. We're going to do it. Mm-hmm. We're going to try. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are there particular concepts or theories that are guiding this COVID-19 research? Oh, I think the basic concept is that of complex adaptive systems, recognizing that um, the segue into my next question, um, which is, are there, or what are the primary methods that you're using for this project? Well, this is very interesting, because it is COVID-19. We really can't do in-person interviews. So we have looked there, and I, this is also where the technology has been really important, because all those countries that were hit by the virus were all developed countries, you know, China, Japan, Korea, Italy, Ireland, and the US, etc. So there's been an extraordinary amount of information that is available online. And most of the states, and at least in the US and certainly in other countries, have developed, uh, you know, websites or um, databases that are available in some countries, and I'm sorry to say in some states like Kansas, you know, in the U.S., the governors are blocking the information 
and here you have, you know, Trump that wants the information sent to him, the Health and Human Services, not to the CDC, you know, so they can massage the information. It's just absurd. I mean, you have scientists and policy analysts up and down, jumping up and down. But there's a lot of information that is available online, which means we then need to use different means of data collection and testing. So fortunately, you know, all my career I've been interested in information technology and uh, working with uh, students who have become much better than me <laughs> in using this technology. But using these data sources, and we will be doing models so we'll be developing models, and with, we hope to be using data from the different countries so we can compare the models from across countries. And here, again, uh, one of the things that I think we have a really great resource here in the U.S., so uh, at least in this NSF proposal, you know, which I hope we <laughs> If, if we should be fortunate to receive this, we're um, setting up a set of criteria across the country. So all of the data that is collected would be formatted in the same way. And we would store it at Design Safe CI at Luigi Austin. And we would be able to then do a comparable set of analyses across the country. And uh, these, uh, you know, I'm confident that we can set up a set of metrics and measurements that we would be able to use in at least eight of these countries, uh, you know, across the world, so we would have comparable data. Now, eight countries, is <coughs> and I think we can expand it actually to 12. That's still only a small subset of the, you know, 212 <laughs> countries and territories that we have in the world. But it should give us a wide enough basis of comparison because we have countries in Asia, countries in Europe, you know, North America. We've got the one researcher in North America who's actually Mexican and works with Mexican. I'm sorry, we can include at, at least Mexico in this. But, um, we will be using all means possible. We will also, we hope to do, some qualitative interviews, um, which would probably be online and, uh, you know, via Zoom. Uh, but we would like to use this mix of methods, qualitative interviews. I'm not a big fan of surveys um, because the return rate on surveys, in my judgment, is fallen so that, you know, if you get a 3% response rate, it's, I just think it's not credible, uh, you know, you're getting a little bit of information, but it's just not reliable. But, uh, and we have to acknowledge that even these websites like the Johns Hopkins uh, Research Center website, they're using data that is reported to them. And then they're, you know, aggregating it so we are getting aggregated data. Uh, we are looking at can you disaggregate the data at least, you know, one or two levels down. Um, here in California, I really, really believe because Governor Newsom has put together a really excellent um, data, you know, website data set, and it's got a lot of information on it. So, uh, you know, it's, at this stage, uh, it's really excellent. I don't think we could match that in many of the other U.S. states, but uh, at least it gives us, we have some state models, uh, but what we're hoping to develop is literally nothing less than a global infrastructure for public health information, aggregated information that can be shared and analyzed across countries. Wow. Again, another very ambitious uh, process. <laughs> yes. I, I guess I, I think I didn't answer exactly your question. So in terms of methods, we would be using literally all methods. Uh, reviewing secondary data that is reported in the field science, we would be <coughs> 
you know, there's a possibility of them as our researchers would like to do a survey and think that we ought to at least try it. And, you know, so we may, we may do that. Uh, I think qualitative interviews will be much more likely and we would probably be able to do, you know, sort of expert interviews, uh, even just a few at each level uh, for each country, um, which would be good. And then uh, we would be doing modeling. Um, I've used the AnyLogic modeling program, but we would be developing models you know, using R, which doesn't cost, you know, it's free, and all the countries can use it. Uh, any logic I like a lot, but it's expensive, and I couldn't ask, you know, people in developing countries to put out the money, well, $8,000 for any logic program that you can do it in R. Uh, so this is one of the things we are doing, and um, it's also here we would be making good use of the NSF facilities because uh, we can create and you know using design safe CI uh, if each of the countries and they would all be members uh, have their own accounts and put their own data in and then uh, design safe has what they call the Jupyter notebook where we can actually create a modeling program and run it in Design Safe CI, which makes that kind of technical modeling capacity available to students in uh, you know, developing countries like uh, India or Portugal uh, that they wouldn't otherwise have the capacity to do. So we're hoping. Yes. <laughs> Fingers crossed. And are these all methods that you've used before? Yes, I have used them, and I've had this one rule. So my background is political science, right? <laughs> but I look at the importance of technology. But I wanted my students to learn this, but I've had this one rule that I could not teach, ask my students to use a technique that I myself did not use. So I had to learn each of these technologies and then, of course, make it available to them. They work with it every day. They become much better than I am on it. But at least I know what the technologies can and cannot do. And each of these technologies has its strengths and its weaknesses. Um, I, I really have become quite an advocate of the program of R. I know that it's a really modified computer language, but it's free and it's available. It doesn't cost anything. And, I, you know, people can use it and adapt it and write their own programs. And so most of the work that we would be doing, we would be running, I think, in R. Um, some people prefer Python. I think Python is a little clumsy, uh, but uh, it does it's maybe easier for social science students to, get, to learn, <laughs> I, but maybe because I struggled so with R and also taught it, that uh, I do think R is a little more flexible and uh, you can do more things with it. So, um, but you know, gradually, I honestly think social scientists need to use these methods if we're going to work with the computer technologies. <laughs> in any, you know, master's program in public policy. Mm -hmm. So that's my bias. <laughs> Your your biases are are very much well welcome here. <laughs> that's that's what we're we're trying to find out. <laughs> um, and the different countries that the project will be taking place in are these uh, countries where you personally have worked in the 20, was it tw 23 countries where you've done research? Uh, well, let's see. Yes, I, I have worked in every single one of them except the UAE. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, almost all of these countries have had earthquakes. Uh, so I've worked in China, in Korea, you know, only I haven't done a study there, but 
duration of the project? Well, uh, this is interesting. These are, I mean, their research coordination network grants are, they're little grants. It's only 500,000 uh, K, of that they're four or five years. And actually, I think that timeline is about right because to establish a network and to get it embedded in the organization, it takes about that amount of time. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the grants are interesting because they don't fund the answering research. And that means that each of the members of the network have to find their own research money to do their studies. But what the network grant does is fund the coordination activities. So basically, it's going to fund a website and uh, data storage, and we will initially, um, Naeem Kabuchu at the University of Central Florida will be the principal investigator, and he'll set up a website at UCF, and the initial storage will be at UCF. But we're having each of the members would already format their data in the, according to the criteria that are needed for design state and set up an account at Design Safe. So we're building the uh, database through these funds. And then the critical issue is who takes it over. One of the advantages of Design Safe is that it can be accessed by anyone anywhere in the world. Okay. And uh, what I would like, we want to be able to prototype so that the international agency can, you know, like the World Health Organization, UN, OCHA, you know, can see and understand that this can work. <laughs> and if you build the technology and the organizational support, essentially a socio-technical system, uh, that we're going to be able to 
rules, how to judge a control much more quickly, and really build a much more resilient world. I mean, I think we're looking at a world where extreme events are going to, you know, just continue to increase, and unless we do something about it, it becomes simply unsustainable. And this is honestly what's driving the situation in California. The frequency and the extent and the ferocity of the wildfires has really just pushed all state, public, city, county agencies in the direction. We've got to work together to, mm-hmm. you know, deal with it, which, you know, to me is the only way out. Mm-hmm. 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 What do you anticipate to be the primary challenges associated with conducting your COVID-19 research? I think the primary challenge is, is really getting access to the decision makers in each country. We would like to be able to interview. Ideally, what we would like to be able to do is to interview people at the national level, at the state provincial level, and at the local level to see if there is coordination across those levels or what the the role of communication is, what the pattern of communication is, and where the breaks in the process are. Our assumption is if the communication is clear and direct and simultaneous, the coordination will follow. And, you know, which, just look at the state, and this is not what we've had, and what we get in COVID-19 is the U.S., you know, out of control, but being able to identify that document and set up cases where it has worked well, where, uh, and in some cases like Korea, which indeed it has worked very well, but there have been costs to that. And what are the costs, uh, you know, France, Italy, Germany, I would probably say in the Western world has done the best job. And it's still been voluntary, but it's been an informed, consistent message from, you know, Angela Merkel, who has been able to communicate that to the different vendor and to different cities, and you've got a much stronger, clearer, more consistent understanding of the risk in Germany and a much better management of structure. And then, you know, compare that with Sweden, where, you know, for, you know, people were following, quote, the science, but you had a scientist who, I think, was, didn't understand what he was working with, and was narrowly leading his entire country in the wrong direction, at great cost. Mm-hmm. And then you had Norway, again, a little tiny country, homogenous country, I mean, it's only 6 million people, it's a little bit like Ireland, you know, and it's a northern country, and, you know, small cities, etc. you don't have the kind of intense traffic that you have in major U.S. metropolitan areas. Um, so, you know, I think it's going to be very interesting to see the different case studies <coughs> essentially come out. <coughs> You know, in large countries like the U.S. and China, you take different, you know, different vignettes, different studies of different metropolitan regions. So, like, um, I think we'd have a very different profile in uh, California than we would have, for example, in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Or Texas. Yeah. <laughs> so the the challenge would be to access the decision makers on the top for these qualitative interviews? Right. Okay. I think that will be our big challenge. Okay. And if we can, we have to be able to persuade them that their advice will not only be heard, but it will be incorporated in a, in an anonymous, non politicized way. So we're asking for their experience as professionals, uh, not in any kind of Okay. So that's, uh, that's going to be trickier in the U.S. 
And I will say in China as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, we all know that disasters occur in highly politicized environments. Uh, and one of the things we want to do is to try and politicize it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a huge challenge. <laughs> it is. It yeah. really is a challenge. Yeah. yeah. So now shifting to the, the tail end of the interview, um, much like everyone else, your day-to-day -day life is probably being affected by the pandemic. What are some of the changes to your personal life that are impacting your professional life and your research? I spend a whole lot of my time on Zoom calls <laughs> or Microsoft Teams or Blue Jeans, which is what we use at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, it's been a major adjustment, but what has been amazing to me is how much we were able to do literally using video conferencing, and it's been a much more intense pattern of communication because, I, you know, just as I said, I mean, I'm communicating with WhatsApp <laughs> with my colleagues in Indonesia right now, literally. And when you're doing this, you know, in different time zones, so I get WhatsApp, you know, pings at 3 in the morning. <laughs> and it's as if you need to be available 24-7 uh, when you're working internationally, which is really critical. Uh, I think... It also means that you have to invest more time and effort to ensure that your communication is clear and strong and that you check, check, double check the work that you're doing so you don't make inadvertent mistakes of omission that if you're with somebody in the room, you just assume this is, is the case and they understand it and so on. But you leave a Zoom meeting and you have to go back and say, well, did you understand exactly? Or am I understanding what you are saying? And so it's really spending more effort in communication to clarify that communication and to be particularly, um, you know, I want to articulate what you are trying to do much more clearly uh, when you are not in a room with someone and you assume they know what you know and that understand what you know, uh, but it's not always the case. And I think this is much more difficult when you're working internationally with colleagues in other studies. And uh, because they're in their own study, and you know, with my colleagues in Indonesia, our communication is in English because I don't know Bahasa Indonesian. But then their communication with one another is in Bahasa. So I have to go back and check with them. <laughs> Did I understand you correctly? Did you understand me? And uh, I think that's uh, probably been the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And then no travel, so, you know, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great for us. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so uh, you know, that's been a big thing. But I, think, I would say the communication has been the most important and probably the one that deserves the most attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the final question is, what have been the consequences if any, of the demonstrations following the death of George Floyd on you and on your research. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Christine. I, I just didn't quite hear all of that. Sure. The, the, it was about George Floyd. I, mm -hmm. I didn't. Uh, what have been the consequences, if any, of the demonstrations following the death of George Floyd on you. Well, oh, I think there have been significant consequences. Uh, maybe 
be especially in the social services search, and especially in the city. And it's been very interesting to watch and hear in the my questions for today. Thank you very much for taking the time and answering the questions. Um, before I close, are there any further questions that you have about the research project or anything? Well, I think it's really interesting what it is that you're doing. So, is it that you're interviewing uh, researchers on the uh, EER, the social science So one of the team members had gone through and looked at the awardees of the um, Converge Rapid Response Grants, the NSF Quick Response, and a couple of others, and then from those selected researchers who have specialized in disasters in the past, not people who have just started COVID research 
because of because of the pandemic. And then we've reached out. There are a team of I think five five of us five five or six. So five of us doing interviews, um, inviting uh, researchers to participate. Um, and so they're based mostly in the U.S., but there are a couple in other parts of the world. Good luck with your project, and uh, the only thing I would ask is uh, before you send a photo, you send a photo. Yes, absolutely. So we'll, um, once the transcripts are, have, have been completed, then we'll send them back, and then you can look them over and see what we, we are allowed to use. Okay. Very good. Well, take care. Good thank luck. you. Thank thank you very much and and congrats again on the on the Indonesian project. That's wonderful, wonderful news. Fingers crossed. <laughs> take care. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks.